Welcome to Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza. This week, our guests look at the persuasive power of video from two different technological and generational perspectives. In the second half of our program, we'll head down to Washington, D.C. to talk with Michael Pack, an experienced documentary producer and former senior vice president for television programming at the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. But first, we're joined by John Popola, the CEO and creative director of Emergent Order, a young video production startup probably best known for its Keynes versus Hayek rap videos. John, welcome to the show. Oh, thanks for having me. John, when we met, I heard you speak at a conference. I didn't know who you were at the time, but like many economics geeks, I'm a huge fan of your Keynes versus Hayek rap videos, the ones you made with Russ Roberts. I understand they've had over 7 million views on, on YouTube. Is that correct? Yeah, it's really been pretty astonishing. We recently just did a search in the YouTube search field for economics and ranked by view count. And I think Fear the Boom and Bust and Fight of the Century, the two Keynes High Crap <laughs> videos, actually ranked, I believe, up in the top three. It's been a phenomenon. And, you know, for listeners who have been living in a cave and haven't, haven't seen these, I'm going to, if you don't mind, play a clip just to give them a flavor for what it's like. Let me, let me tee it up. Freddie. Keynes. Hey, listen, party at the Fed. Already? 20 minutes. Lobby. John Maynard Keynes. Oh, F.A. Hayek. Yeah, yeah. we're opposed. opposed. We oppose we each other philosophically. philosophically. In the same studio. We've been going back and forth for a century. I want to steer markets. I want them set free. There's a boom and bust cycle and good reason to fear it. Play low interest no. rates. It's the animal spirits. John I mean, it goes on from there. Whose crazy idea was it to package economics lessons in a rap video? <laughs> you know, it, uh, it was a conflagration of a lot of brains, actually. I had reached out to my favorite economist, Russ Roberts, cold called him from no. my office at Spike TV <laughs> in New York. I left him this long message saying, you don't know me, but I listen to your podcast and I'm a uh, I've gotten to be a real geek about econ and the, and the business cycle, and I want to do a video about monetary policy. Please call me back. I'm a producer at Spike, and I think we could do something awesome together. Did you tell me it was going to be sure a rap video or just a video? <laughs> no, no. I just I, I there wasn't there wasn't much of a concept of <laughs> doing something creative in video, and we went down a number of different roads together. It was actually my wife, Lisa, who said, you, you should do something like Flight of the Concord, something fun and musical, mm -hmm. because this economic stuff is so boring, Dry. I can't even believe you're that interested in it. And so the music, the actual first concept was, to, we thought, hey, maybe we could do a, a sort of mock sitcom, like Keynes in the City, mm -hmm. where Keynes lives his sort of uh, deficit spending lifestyle. And um, we see how that plays out. <laughs> uh -huh. and it's like the odd couple with him and, him and Hayek. And then we thought, you know, that's going to be pretty difficult to pull off from an acting and writing standpoint. Let's just do the, the show open for that, like the, you know, mm -hmm. like the Three's Company open. And so we actually wrote and recorded a song as a parody of Staying Alive, where it's Keynes <laughs> and then his ideas are staying alive. Yep. yep. You know, the New York Times, my biggest fan, helps me sell my stimulus plan. I'm staying alive. <laughs> oh, I, I want to see that. Do you have a copy of that oh, somewhere? <laughs> oh, you. You, you you don't want to hear it. It's uh it's rough. I, I did my best um Bee Gees impression and best here has to be really with a giant ass. Well you know the, the production <laughs> values of the finished product are extraordinary. The sets, the costumes. What did you spend on these things? Well the first one was really done on a tiny shoestring and I called in every favor and I wore a lot of hats myself mm. from producing to cinematography to being the production assistant that returned all the gear the next day. And and with a ton of help from my partner Josh here at Emergent Order and and Lisa and a whole host of people. So I called in every favor on the first one. On the second one, Fight of the Century, we, we, we had the exposure from the success of the first. And so we were able to reach out and raise uh, actually about 200 grand okay. from about from about 200 different people. So we really basically crowdsourced it, uh, working with the Mercatus Center out of George Mason University. What a University. great idea. 200,000 for a 10-minute video. The quality, is, the, the quality is pretty good. Let me play one more clip from the Fight of the Century, which actually is my favorite. 
And one of the reasons it's my favorite is the, the economics lessons in there are actually quite precise and deep. Just, just hold on, let me tee this up. So spending's not free, that's the heart of the matter. Too much is wasted as cronies get fatter. The economy's not a car, there's no engine to stall. No expert can fix it, there's no it at all. The economy's us, we don't need a mechanic. Put away the wrenches, the economy's organic. Which way should we choose? Off the bottom up for more time. The fight continues. Gains in high, it's second bound. It's time to. <laughs> What kind of feedback have you gotten, not from economists, but from the general public you were trying to reach? I'll say the most amazing thing that I've experienced in making these videos with Russ is considering how jargon-filled and fast-moving they are. They get used in high schools and colleges all over the country and even around the world. Let me give you three examples of the kind of impact we've had and, and really sort of it's hard to imagine this, this except in retrospect. Mm-hmm. A teacher in Hong Kong sent us a lesson plan that he uses for it with his students based on Fear the Boom and Bust <laughs> to teach a macroeconomics class. A fourth grader, a nine-year-old, mm-hmm. sent a paper that he or she had written, I think it was a girl actually, for her, cl- for I don't, I'm not even sure what class. <laughs> uh, in fourth grade, fourth grade, I can't they're doing economics. You're, you're learning econ, but with an actual summary of the video. I mean, this is pencil on lined paper, talking about why they think Hayek is right and Keynes is wrong. There's a good measure of of dad in there. I'm going to imagine sure. or mom. Sure, but from a point it, of view, if it becomes a teachable moment for adults to open children's eyes to the importance of these ideas, or for teachers or professors to work into the curriculum, isn't that the whole point? That is the point, and uh, probably the single biggest cultural impact moment, at least for me, was uh, I was approached by a teacher over email just asking, hey, could, could, do you have an instrumental version of that Fight of the Century video music? And I said, sure, yeah, here it is, and I sent her a link to it and didn't think much about it after that. And then a couple months later, a video surfaced of her class putting on a live version of Fight of the Century on stage in front of their entire <laughs> high school. and So now it's part of know, the corpus, the, the high school play corpus. Oh, and the, the kids are cheering at the end. I mean, you've got like a macro and political economy debate of epic proportions happening, and, and the kids are going crazy for it. I was going to ask you whether young people, including millennials, have a clue or care about these issues, but what I'm hearing is you can get their attention. Well, I saw recently a poll that said millennials actually have a historically low trust in government, which um, is pretty interesting. I, I have to imagine that the boomers, when they were kids, I would think maybe rival that. John, many people believe that the battle of ideas between Keynes and Hayek is the most important ideological battle of our times. And Keynes, of course, believed that governments could borrow, print, and spend their way out of economic downturns and Hayek supporting less I fear capitalism sound money. With Keynesians firmly in control of the White House and the Federal Reserve and, and stimulus cheerleaders sitting on editorial boards all across the media, do you really think Hayek has a chance? You know, for a long time, Hayek and Mises and, and the free market economists were in the wilderness in a debate over whether socialism could work. You know, Paul Samuelson, a, 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 mm-hmm. a Keynesian through and through, but obviously more broadly a believer in big government and a robust government intervention, actually had a graph in his textbooks that showed the point at which the USSR would eclipse the United States as, it, as it's in terms of GDP because of how fast the USSR was apparently growing. Mm-hmm. Five-year and plans. For, and for decades, that graph kept getting adjusted 10 years forward. <laughs> oh, it's going to be 10 more years. Oh, it's going to be 10 more years. That sounds like years. global warming graphs. I mean, unrepentant. They li- literally, you can like, Google it, Paul Samuelson Soviet graphs. <laughs> Don't His, do that. Right before the wall fell, the most recent edition of Paul Samuelson's book still had a graph showing that the USSR would overtake the United States. This is at a time where where it was widely known that 
you know, much like Venezuela today, they couldn't keep toilet paper on the shelves. I mean, it was a it was a paper empire. So what are champions of free markets doing wrong that a person like that can continue to succeed in academia? Well, I suppose my bigger point is in telling that story that if we're right and if our ideas are correct, eventually reality catches up. And so even uh, today, you've got Thomas Piketty with his new book about mm-hmm. capital, and it's being hailed from the left as the Marxist revival. Even he concedes that we need markets and private property because they create the basic rules and incentives for mm-hmm prosperity and and entrepreneurship and that you take away private property, you take away the incentive for people to make anything and you end up with poverty. So in some respects, there is a broader battle that was won. Fortunately, we're sort of creeping ever closer back to that same problem. Well, the economic downturn in 2008 gave them another opportunity to try their remedies one more time and, uh, and with much the same results. I think that the United States is in a very unique position in that we have the sort of dollar dominance where, say, a country like Canada gets a a bond downgrade in the 1990s and even a left liberal government will reverse course and cut spending. I think the United States is in – it's it's called exorbitant privilege or it Mm -hmm. used to be during the monetary debates in the 70s and 80s. Until people stop buying our debt – uh, there's not a lot of incentive for politicians to cut spending or take a look at Hayek's ideas. No, as long as we're the reserve currency, we can pretty much do as we please. I look at your background and I see a solid media guy, and I, I, I pulled out the tongue-in-cheek bio on your website, and it ends with the phrase, after the passing of your hero, Steve Jobs, a grief-stricken John found solace at the bottom of an economics textbook. When did you come about these ideas? I really was first turned on to econ in 2006, maybe it was even 2007 with the Ron Paul candidacy. I hadn't had any formal economics training, save for maybe one class in high school, which wasn't particularly good. I guess you could say it was growing up a little bit. Mm -hmm. I had a, a family, I had a mortgage and strange things were happening all around me. My, my, my neighbor in Hoboken, turned around and sold their apartment for dramatically more money than we had bought ours for only a year and a half prior. And it just didn't really make a lot of sense. I didn't, didn't seem to be massive increases in the population of New York city or Hoboken. It was hard to understand why what was going on values would be doing that. And when Ron Paul debated, uh, Rudy Giuliani and the rest of the Republicans and said, we're on the verge of a serious crisis, and here's why, and here's how, and the, and, the, and they all laughed at him. I thought, Something's, there's something here. There's something going on. I want to know more about why this guy is able to look at these ideas and look at this scenario and, and articulate it in this way. So that was really the starting point so for you me. Became, you became one of, of a self-taught uh, economics geek like, like many of us, and you founded a company called Emergent Order. What's that all about? So after the success of the first rap, I started to get approached by different free market organizations and foundations and like-minded people seeking to create more video content. And for about a year, I sort of did a couple projects on the side, which was difficult because I had a very demanding Mm -hmm. job at Spike, which I liked very much. But I was just so enraptured with trying to communicate these ideas and read about them that it seemed like the time was right if I was going to make an entrepreneurial leap to uh, apply my skills to this effort on a sustained basis. And there seemed to be a demand for it from organizations and from students and teachers. And I, I certainly felt there was a need to get these ideas out there. That's why I made the videos. So I teamed up with my best friend, Josh, and my wife, Lisa, and together we started Emergent Order. Tell us about some of the projects you've worked on. Well, the first project under the banner was actually Fight of the Century. Mm-hmm. So, and then we've since produced uh, another economics uh, project called the Deck the Halls of Macro Follies, which was a <laughs> <laughs> it was sort of a, a a parody of those old Time Life Christmas albums, mm-hmm. really taking aim at this idea that consumption drives economic growth, which is this bizarre 
Keynesian fallacy that you hear, especially around the Christmas season. And distribution is primarily YouTube and and uh, and new media. Yeah, probably our favorite projects are when we come up with an idea for our Econ Stories YouTube channel, and and put stuff up there. We have a new project right now called Econ Pop, which is a, a very simple show concept. We have a, a host, Andrew Heaton who reviews movies and TV shows, but from an economics point of view. So basically uses the films and their storylines and their plots and their characters as an opportunity to explore economic ideas. I listened to the House of Cards, uh, the Economics of House of Cards show this morning, which started out cut into the real show. You cut your character into the real show and then became an explanation of public choice theory, which I found (laughs) to be quite a pivot. (laughs) That's a great example of actually some very interesting dynamics and economics in a piece of mainstream content. I mean, public choice theory is sort of the economics of politics without the romance, without this sort of notion Mm -hmm. that just because these people are democratically elected, somehow they have magical powers and signing their names to pieces of paper can create goods and services out of thin air. And so, and, and they suddenly drop off all of their self-interest and all of their own personal um, incentives once they uh, win an election. I noticed you recruited Andrew Heaton to be in the show. He's a Fox business producer and a stand-up comic. Right. Yeah, he's terrific. <laughs> uh, he's he's a far better on camera personality than myself. <laughs> so, so we really wanted to use that use it use an opportunity to you know work with somebody fresh and. You know, he's got a great sense of humor, and so it was a great match. I've always said that the free market movement needed more stand-up comics and single-panel cartoonists, and it seems to be happening. It's funny you should say that. We've thought this, thought about doing a Keynes and Hayek uh, comic strip. <laughs> we come up with a lot of ideas. All I need to do is uh, set up a side business that can make me a couple billion dollars, and go. I'll really be able to change the world. <laughs> <laughs> what are your plans for Econ Pop? Are you just going to do regular productions? We set out initially to try to do release one every two weeks for for a sort of a season of eight to 12 episodes. Mm-hmm. And we slowed the pace down to one every month just because our, our emphasis has always been on quality first. And, you know, we see these videos as being something evergreen that if they're done right and if the scripts are sound, there's something that a teacher or a student or anybody else could watch three years from now, five, ten years from now and get something out of. So... We sort of aim for the longer run there. The production values really do matter. The guy in front of the chalkboard technique droning on just does not work as a way to communicate. Well, I think that there's something really powerful about how our hearts and our sort of emotions and our intuitions really prime our minds and and really lead us. And so I think that's what makes media and storytelling so powerful. And we really understand the world by way of the narratives Mm -hmm. we hear and tell. And that's what we're trying to do with our company is tell those narratives uh, with a classical liberal point of view. Aside from projects you do on your own, Nickel, which presumably gets some, some advertiser support, who's your ideal client? Well, I would say our ideal client is an organization or a foundation that really is committed to educating people in the long run and is excited to see that come about in a way that's highly produced Mm -hmm. and can appreciate the value of that production, looking at the work we've already done and seeing the ongoing impact, the leverage. I mean, for example, the Kings of Hayek Raps get several thousand views a day, even though they're many years old now. And that's a testament to the quality and to the sort of long-run sustainability when something's really nicely produced. Probably the most famous example of this is Milton Friedman's Free to Choose series back from, I, I think, the 80s. It's been a long time since that ran. Are you contemplating anything on that scale? I would love to produce something on that scale. But I, I do think that in a certain sense, the world we live in now, I think that there's a there's a lot of value in this shorter form mm content, stuff that's shareable. You know, with, with in the 80s, you didn't have social media, you didn't have the internet, you only had broadcast. Mm-hmm. And now everyone can broadcast. Any, any individual can broadcast what they grab on their smartphone in real time directly to the whole world. So I think that's changed the dynamics of sort of media consumption. That's part of why we focus on this shorter form content and our background in um, TV promotion and commercial, I think, 
also gives us a strength in that space. Ten minutes or less is like writing a column compared to a novel. I mean, you really have to be crisp. It's an interesting challenge. And I'll tell you, I've written several articles here and there for Forbes and on uh, the NewsHour website and elsewhere. And um, weirdly, when I try to do that, I always end up being awfully long-winded and very, <laughs> very much struggle to... Um, Cut it down. Make it pithy and short. And, uh, you know, they say the, the old Mark Twain, I've, I've written you a shorter letter, if only I had the time. It's a, it's a lot of work. I was Googling up some of your work this morning, and I found your cronies cartoons. It seemed to be uh, fake commercials for action figures that go after crony capitalists. I wonder if I can play a, a brief clip of that, and then maybe you can give us the, uh, the background. Great. Heads, they win. Tails, you lose. Forget the rule book. They make the rules. Want to compete? Oh. You'll be rejected. Get with cronies. They're connected. I mean, you can't see the video. Obviously, this is radio, but it's it's sort of your standard Saturday morning cartoon figures with little action figures that represent different crony capitalists from whether it's banking or oil or whatever. Where did this come from? Well, some of our friends in D.C. that are involved in political advocacy and had said, you know, you guys should really take on crony capitalism and there's some organizations that are really interested in, in that subject. So, you know, why don't you come up with something like that and we could probably introduce you to some people who would be interested in that. So we came up with this concept of the cronies, which was actually an idea that began life with how we might do another Keynes versus Hayek. And we thought, what if we did a sort of Keynes and Hayek boxing match toy ad <laughs> with the two action figures and so lisa resurrected that idea and said we should do that for the cronies mm -hmm. cronies with a c and then of course the kids toy spelling they always add a z or a k or an x so we figured well, let's just spell cronies with a k and we created these uh five characters the center of which is big g for big government mm -hmm. and then we ended up teaming up with generation opportunity to actually, you know, launch and debut the cronies. And there's some more in the pipeline, and they've been awesome to work with. They're a like-minded sort of classical liberal limited government organization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What did you use, 3D printers to make the little characters? They look like real toys. Yeah, they are. In fact, so this was pretty amazing. We worked with an unbelievable crew, and my partner Josh headed up the toy side of this and worked with an actual 3D printer company here in Austin, we made two sets of each crony and actually had them hand-painted for the shoot by a, an artist who works on the McFarlane toys. So hmm. uh, and they, they were actually tacky to the touch because of the turn, you know, we <laughs> turned the whole way. thing around in about 10 weeks, soup to nuts, which is very fast for something that involved original 2D animation mm -hmm. and 3D printed action figures. No, it's a very, again, it's very high quality product. It's not the kind of thing you bang off on your, on your iPhone. So, John, the left has dominated Hollywood and media for generations. It's had an enormous impact on our culture and our politics. Do you think this is starting to change and perhaps we're seeing other voices come in? Well, I think one thing that's happening is that the technological paradigm shifts that the Internet have brought about is starting to end broadcast as we know it, or mm -hmm. in some ways it already has. So people that want different content can now find it and they can basically skip over the old gatekeepers to get it. So that's sort of on the consumer side. There's such an enormous amount of choice and tools that there is a proliferation. We can make these videos with pretty radical free market ideas in them and find an audience. Mm -hmm. The business models are still catching up, so it's uh, it's th there's challenges there for everybody involved in the media business. Well, it might start out as a labor of love, but the trick is to find what resonates and, and figure out where the dollars are going to come from. Yeah, and I mean, you know, obviously, if you can make a profit, that's a big signal that you're doing something right. I think, in some respect, you're always going to have a bias within the creative arts towards a left liberal point of view, and more specifically, an anti-market point of view, just because it's very difficult to make a film or a story about the unseen, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is what ba Bastiat referred to with good economics is about showing the unseen, not just the scene. Mm -hmm. So uh, when you're trying to film the unseen, that's a difficult challenge. 
And uh, having really worked hard to try to do that, I can tell you it is not easy. So making these ideas personal while still sort of getting across the broader, often very systematic ideas is a challenge. I think the other aspect of what's going on and what I'd like to hopefully see more of is a commitment on the part of folks who want to invest in these ideas to start essentially allocating more capital to media on the right, if you want to say it. There's been a lot of investment in intellectual institutions, which is terrific. And there's, you know, obviously plenty of money that goes into political advertising and stuff like that. But there's this entire world in the middle that on the other side of the intellectual spectrum is very robust. And for those of us that support capitalism and free markets and free people, it's relatively neglected. And so I think that there's a big opportunity there. It's a, it's a hole we've jumped into in the hopes of helping fill in some small way with our little company. And we're, of course, and this is the entrepreneur in me speaking, we're always looking for partners who share that vision, who see the value in a Keynes versus Hayek type project or a cronies type project mm-hmm. that isn't necessarily going to fit neatly into an election cycle, but is going to leave an impact on somebody that changes the way they look at the world. John, where do you see yourself in the emergent order in 10 years? I have no idea, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. <laughs> you know, as an entrepreneur, this is my first entrepreneurial venture. And if it's one thing I've learned, it's that your plans generally don't survive the boots on the ground <laughs> <laughs> moment. Having been associated with dozens and dozens of, of entrepreneurial ventures, I can tell you that's absolutely true. <laughs> you know, it's really, it's exhilarating. And I will say, on a personal level that, you know, I I began my career with a pretty narrow focus on media and entertainment and wanting to direct movies, and I absolutely continue to have that same passion. But there's something so exhilarating also about just creating an enterprise. And it's also terrifying, but it it really is the, the heart of the economic engine that we call capitalism, for lack of a better word. John, you've given me hope talking to you. Thanks for being on the show. Bill, it's been my pleasure talking to you. Thanks for having me on. That was John Popola, CEO and Creative Director of Emergent Order, here on Real Clear Radio Hour, brought to you by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. I'm your host, Bill Frezza, a head, former Senior Vice President for Television Programming at the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Michael Pack, shares what he's learned as an independent documentary producer and a rare advocate of free market principles in the TV business. Stay tuned.